Hi, it's Kirby Simmers, and I welcome you to the Jeffrey Epstein Project podcast. Today, I want to discuss the fact that uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, who uh, on December 8th filed a motion to be heard again by the court requesting that she be released from jail on bail, um, I think the amount, let me just find the amount here. The amount that she proposed was a $28.5 million package, um, which she sought in order to entice the court, namely Judge Nathan, who was presiding again uh, over this case, um, to let her go stay at a pre-selected place in New York City uh, to await her scheduled trial which is expected to be uh, in July of 2021. Well, on December 28th, the judge uh, responded and denied her request. Not only her request to be heard, but basically her request for bail, periodly. So bail denied again, twice. It's just such good news. In such a horrible year as 2020, this is perhaps the best news. Um, so what the court found was that um, that a- a- any all of the information that Ghislaine provided uh, via her attorneys in that motion that it had no bearing on the fact that she was still considered by the court to be a major flight risk. Um, And uh, basically under, I believe it's under a certain um, law, which is defined as US 18 uh, number 3142, a bail hearing may be reopened if the court finds that information exists that was not known to the movement at the time of the hearing and has a material bearing on the issue, whether there are conditions of release that will reasonably assure the appearance. Um, and, and the court found that there was nothing new in Ghislaine's second request. Now, part of the the documents and the reason uh, that this has not been made part of the public record is there are there is concern on Maxwell's side that the people that were listed as her um, you know people who wrote letters on her behalf people who were willing to put up the money and by the way um, most of the money that was presented to be used as bail would have come from theoretically Scott Borgerson, who has been disclosed to be definitely her husband. Um, And I'm going to just backstep now for a minute. Ghislaine Maxwell was married in 2016. She married Scott Borgerson, who was approximately 14 years younger than her. Um, They lived together in the house at Manchester by the Sea, which is a house that um, Orgerson purchased after he divorced his first wife. Um, When we look at the documents for the sale of the house, it is connected to uh, Christine Maxwell. And so the house uh, at Manchester by the Sea, it most most in in all likelihood was purchased for both of them, and that is where Ghislaine Maxwell was living until she was discovered by her neighbors to be who she was. I know I'm going off on a tangent here, and I'll get back to Judge Nathan's. Um, a a, a new denial in in a moment, but I just want to fill in the blanks here. Um, At the time that Ghislaine was living uh, at Manchester by the sea, the house that is theoretically supposed to be Scott Borgerson's home, um, she was seen uh, with Borgerson 
jogging around the area. Um, they have three large, very uh, vicious dogs. And she went around telling people only when pressed that her name was, was G. So she lied about her name. Borgerson lied to the community when he presented himself as, quote, the sole owner of the house, as the sole occupant of the house, because not only, I mean, come on, he didn't move in there alone. He moved in there with Glenn Maxwell. So when it became known uh, last year that Maxwell was living in Manchester by the sea, um, the press started to show up. And um, so that's what prompted her to go buy another house, which she then did in New Hampshire. And she did this, again, using a disguise. She called herself Jen. Um, I forget the last name, but she and a, a man named Scott went into a real estate office. They were shown the property and they uh, said, oh, yes, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, blah, blah. They lied. They used fake names. And then they bought the house, which is called Tucked Away. Very, very interesting because she wanted a very reclusive spot to hide in. They bought that all cash for a million dollars. And so Ghislaine was hiding out in that home when she was arrested on July 2nd by the FBI and the local police. Okay. So at first she did not disclose that um, Scott Borgerson was her husband and what she had been doing commencing from 2016 when she started to transfer her assets to Scott Borgerson's name. And again, I'm going to just take a step back and say that I believe she married Borgerson in order to hide her assets. And Borgerson, in turn, who is seriously, if, if, if you do a little research on him, he is a very um, ambitious man. And if you do a little more research, you'll see he's also not a nice person. You know, he has been known to uh, beat up his first wife. He has been, uh, he's not a gentleman, let's just put it this way. But I think what attracted Borgerson to Maxwell is the same thing that attracted Jeffrey Epstein to Maxwell, and that is those contacts. The contacts that her father, Robert Maxwell, developed when he was a spy. Now, he was a spy for many decades, starting from World War II until he was pushed or fell off the Lady Ghislaine on November the 5th, 1991. Ghislaine Maxwell used those contacts as leverage to make sure she was taken care of for the rest of her life. That is how she connected to Epstein, who was uh, already working for Leslie Wexner. And I think those of you who know me and know my work understand that in my opinion and from my research and my understanding is that Leslie Wexner is a, a, a major intelligence asset for both the United States and for Israel. Connected, Wexner connected Epstein to Maxwell and the two had a perfect combination because she had the contacts for, let's say, people like Prince Andrew, someone like Bill Clinton, and also Donald Trump. Those three connections, including Jean-Luc Brunel, came from Ghislaine Maxwell and were given to Jeffrey Epstein. Those same connections that Ghislaine Maxwell had that Jeffrey Epstein found so tantalizing uh, are the same connections that Scott Borgeson also finds tantalizing. And so each one of these two people, Borgerson and Maxwell, had their own reasons for getting married. I do not believe they, quote, fell in love. I do not believe people like that 
have real feelings for other people. So, okay, my rant is over. <laughs> um, getting back to uh, Judith Nathan, she um, basically is going to give them some time uh, to redact names because apparently Ghislaine Maxwell is concerned that the people on her side are going to get, I don't know, abused, threatened, whatever is, she's just, it just makes no sense to me. Um, since no one is on her side, um, the world has discovered that she was a child pedophile. Um, she was a procurer. Um, the allegations are that she raped a lot of the same victims that Jeffrey Epstein raped. So, but the judge has decided to give her time to have the names that she wants redacted from the public record to be removed before the judge makes um, this public. And she's given them until December 30th, which is tomorrow. Today is the 29th. And, and after that, it will be made public record. But bravo to all of us because Ghislaine Maxwell, her second request for bail has been denied. Um, all right, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I'm so excited that um, it did not go her way. And um, if anything good has come out of uh, 2020, it is that Ghislaine Maxwell has been put in jail, that Ghislaine Maxwell is still in jail, and um, hopefully she will continue to be in jail. Right, this brings us to the second part of what I want to discuss just a little bit. People keep talking about the trial, the trial, the trial. Well, Ghislaine Maxwell was involved with an intelligence agency and frankly, with more than one intelligence agency. In my opinion, I'm just going to come out and say it, that she is part of the CIA and that she's also working for Mossad and possibly another one, maybe MI5, MI6. Who knows? Whoever pays the most. I believe that is who Ghislaine Maxwell has worked for. And um, so that when someone, and I'm going to take um, the case of maybe a, a cocaine lord like El Chapo, right? Or, um, well, let's just use El Chapo for now. Um, when a case like that, and also Iran-Contra for the Iran-Contra hearings and, and for the MKUltra hearings, when, when sensitive information about the CIA and even the Mossad um, is sort of like at danger to be heard by the public because of a, uh, because of a, um, a court hearing, a, tr a trial, you know, a trial by jury or just a trial just in front of a court, everything is made, um, public, you know, there's a transcript and that information goes on file. What happens in these cases uh, is that, um, there, there are instructions not to reveal to someone like Ghislaine Maxwell, not to reveal X, Y, or Z, which would expose the government's hand in Ghislaine's tr uh, criminal activities. And so based on that, I find it hard to believe that um, there is going to be a trial. Uh, I think that they will allow her to plea out to do something and they will at some point let her go home uh, after reaching some kind of plea deal. Maybe she'll agree to do some time. Maybe she'll just agree to give us uh, some names that are low-hanging fruit. Um, perhaps that's what's going to happen, but I don't see a trial necessarily happening. There's just too many important names that are attached to this case. If there is a trial, Ghislaine Maxwell will not be telling the whole truth, and she will be doing that with the help of the government. The government will not allow her to reveal sensitive information. So in any event, um, I will keep you guys posted. Um, we are still in the holiday uh, week, and so I hope you're all having a really nice holiday. I want to do a, a major shout-out to... 
um, Greg Olier, who has become a, a patron of my Patreon. Uh, that's very kind of him. Um, and also, uh, it's just so many of you have been kind enough to join my Patreon. I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, Sean Atwood also became a paying member of my Patreon. And just, just, just so great that activists are supporting other activists and that we've all sort of come together <laughs> to make sure that um, the voices of the victims are heard and that justice, some kind of justice, is done. Um, okay, so I wish you all a happy new year and the next one is going to be better. I know it. All right, thanks. Bye.